I want to welcome today's distinguished panel. Mr. Seth Frankman, Executive Director, the Student Borrower Protection Center. Ms. Persis Yu, Staff Attorney at the National Consumer Law Center. Ms. Ashley Harrington, Senior Policy Counsel, Center for Responsible Lending. Mr. Hassan Menha, writer, producer, and host who has shed light on the issue of student loan servicing. Mr. Jason Delisle, American Enterprise Institute. Without objection, all of your written statements will be made part of the record. Each of you will have five minutes to summarize your testimony. When you have one minute remaining, a yellow light will appear. At that time, I would ask you to wrap up your testimony so we can be respectful of both the witnesses and the committee members' time. Mr. Francis Harrington, Mr. Minaj, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Thank you so much. I want to thank Chairwoman Maxine Waters for the opportunity to testify. And I would like to thank Ranking Member Patrick McHenry for taking the time to Google who I am. Cute. Very My cute. name is Hassan Minhaj. I'm a Muslim, and I condemn radical Islamic terrorism. That has nothing to do with anything. I just want that on the record. It's good to get ahead of these things. Now, Chairwoman Waters invited me here today because I host a political comedy show on Netflix called Patriot Act, which means I may owe some of you guys royalties. Just DM, we can talk later. Now, we recently did an episode on the student loan crisis, and it really hit home with our audience because 44 million Americans owe more than $1.6 trillion of student loan debt. In fact, the day we shot our episode, we polled our studio audience, it was only about 200 people, in that room alone had over $6 million of student loan debt. Now granted, our audience is mainly unemployed poli-sci majors, but that's still a lot of money. Now this issue is sidelining millions of Americans. People are putting off marriage, kids, home ownership, and retirement, especially my generation. So I'm 33, and growing up, it was drilled into our heads. You gotta go to college if you want a middle class job. And we even tell kids today, look, if you don't go to college, you might as well get a face tattoo. And then they point to Post Malone, and we're like, okay, that's one guy. He's a very popular musician. <laughs> but it's true, two thirds of all jobs in America require at least some college. This is the standard now. And that wasn't the case when most members of this committee were in school. And you paid far less for your degrees. That's not speculation. We looked up where the 60 members of this committee went to college and what your school's tuition was at that time. Even adjusting for inflation, college co cost way less across the board. So Chairwoman Maxine Waters, your tuition at Cal State LA in 1971 was the equivalent of about $1,000 a year. Today, Cal State costs well over six grand. That's more than a 500% jump. Congressman King, right? In 1965, Congressman King paid the equivalent of almost 10 grand a year at St. Francis College. Today, St. Francis cost over 25 grand. On average, this entire committee graduated from college 33 years ago and paid an inflation-adjusted tuition of $11,690 a year. Today, the average tuition at all of your same schools is almost $25,000. That's a 110% increase over a period of time when wages have gone up only 16%. So people aren't making more money and college is objectively way more expensive. You see what's happened? We've put up a paywall to the middle class. And if there's one thing Americans don't deserve more of, it's paywalls. That's why we put up our entire show for free on YouTube. It's also because you can't really find anything on Netflix. It's like the lost and found bin of entertainment. You're like, great, another show about people who love cake. <laughs> now, despite these, number, you, these numbers, you often hear the idea, these kids wouldn't be in trouble if they just took some responsibility. But they're trying to be responsible. They're investing in education, and they are trying to pay their loans back. 
And yet many borrowers are still treated like deadbeats because the government has put their financial futures in the hands of predatory for-profit loan servicing companies. Companies like Navient and other companies you will hear from today have a history of misleading borrowers and pushing them into repayment plans that in some cases have cost individual borrowers tens of thousands of dollars in unnecessary interest. And the worst part is, borrowers don't even get to choose their loan servicer. The Department of Education chooses for you. So there's no competition that makes these companies provide better service. Now look, we know the deck is stacked against student borrowers in ways that it wasn't 10 or even 15 years ago. And they deserve some basic protections. Americans should not have to go bankrupt pursuing higher education. And they should never be preyed upon by underregulated loan servicing companies. So members of this committee, we know the government is capable of stepping in during a financial crisis. So really all I'm asking today is, why can't we treat our student borrowers the way we treat our banks? Because 44 million Americans, that is too big to fail. Thank you so much for your time, and I will now go back to where I came from. Uh, Mr. Minaj, out, as you outlined in your show, the question of cost is a fundamental issue too, and you address that. And you also address the servicers. So you go from the, the question of the debt, but the key question as well is, and you get to this in some ways, but underwriting, there is no underwriting for a loan. There is no question of a student being informed enough about the decision they're making that is a life-changing decision. And we have the federal government creating a mechanism and then using private sector folks to then service their decision, right? So you don't, you don't say underwriting, but you get at it, right? That these students are given way too many choices for uh, their financial literacy, basically, and don't have an understanding of what that will mean to their life for a decade, two decades, three decades. And that decision they make as a 17 or 18 or 19 year old and the impact it's gonna have on their ability to buy a house or a car or have children or get married and the societal impact on that. So you do a great job of highlighting that, I have to say. Um, and you're, you're a fan of the show. I don't wanna do that to I'll, you because I'll get it's you probably that not helpful. I'll get you that t-shirt. Um, I, I, I'll watch you right after I finish watching the Chappelle special. So we'll move from, from there. Uh, Mr. Lyle, as you... Mr. Yes. Yes, one of the things we covered on the show is the fact that when a student borrower calls their loan servicer, say Navient, Navient will rush you off the phone, oftentimes in seven minutes or less, and they will advise you to go into loan forbearance instead of an income-based repayment plan, which would probably be better for you. So that m simple misinformation is a problem, and I think student borrowers need just basic bill of rights, like a protection to, to not let that perpetuate. Right, thank you. I get, yeah, I get the sense you would complain, though, if Navient kept them on the phone. No, no not a, you wouldn't even tolerate that from United Airlines. read all of these terms to them to make sure they knew exactly what they were getting into. I guess people would be very upset about that, too. But they, they want their best option, not a CVS receipt. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very helpful. Problem here. Thank you. Uh, what was the question again? What's the major problem? Yeah, what are your thoughts on uh, uh, the role of the U.S. Department of Education in managing uh, its loans? Just the fact that they outsourced it to private loan servicers? Your general thoughts. I mean, my general thoughts is this. Are you familiar with the rapper Lil Uzi Vert? No. I think it's a huge problem that the youth of America have to bombard their favorite rapper, pop musician, and ask them to pay back their student loans. They're not even asking for selfies anymore. Are you a fan of Taylor Swift? I, well, if, Are you a Swifty? Because e even her fans have gone up to her and said, will you please pay back my student loans? That's how desperate student borrowers are. I'd like to, to turn to you, Mr. Minaj, and ask you in your uh, investigations and your expose, um, what sharp practices, you know, uh, deceitful practices, deceiving practices, manipulative practices, did you all see in connection with the servicing? So we start with, should anybody have taken out the loan in the first place? We can disagree about that and the cost of higher education. 
But in terms of servicing, what did you see where there were improprieties? Specifically, we saw when it came to servicing, when a student who was actively trying to find the best possible option to repay, when they would get on the phone with their loan servicer, they oftentimes were given misinformation. So instead of telling them to, hey, you should probably do an income-based repayment plan, because they were trying to get them off the phone within seven minutes or less, they would say, go into loan forbearance. So that's actively, students are given bad advice that will hurt them later on down the road. And they think they're doing the right thing because the person on the phone told them to, the expert told them to. Did you find any particular servicer to be more abusive than others, or maybe not abusive, but... Um, did, Navient was really give, bad. You, the, do you have Comcast? Uh, Navient is like the Comcast of <laughs> loan servicing. You ever feel that frustration where you're like, ah, they're the worst, but I then you're, you have no choices I, because the Department of Education put you in this arranged marriage that you can't get out of? Okay. okay. Anybody else? For what it's worth, I, I was waitlisted to go to law school. You were? Yes. I, I could see why. I'm not. <laughs> because your professors would have had to take you on all day. So, uh, I actually no. think I was a great. I think I was a great student. <laughs> and, I, and for what it's worth, my fingers are still crossed. I'm waiting. It's been 12 <laughs> years, but you never know. All right, I, I yield back to the chair. Thank you. Shouldn't the FHA base debt to income ratios on the amount a student borrows actually pay? Yes. Miss You? Absolutely. Miss Harrington? Yes. Mr. Minaj? Sure. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez, I'm, I'm very passionate about this issue because uh, I'm lucky. Uh, when I left college, I didn't have any student loan debt uh, because I have immigrant parents and they made me live at home with them. So I don't have crippling student loan debt, I have crippling emotional debt. And Congress has yet to stand up and do here. anything about it <laughs> and stand up to my parents and say what you did was wrong. But you don't have to have crippling student loan debt to, to have empathy for people who are investing in their futures. And that's why I'm here today. Thank you. Oh, and I would like to hear the panel discussion uh, on uh, the land student loans uh, for at least a year until they can find a job and the ability uh, to uh, refinance student loans. And I'll start with you, Mitchell. I'm not an expert when it comes to refinancing, although I am very good with Microsoft Excel and macros. On a system that's getting that done. Mr. Minaj, do you know what the cost of in-state tuition is currently at UC Davis? Go Aggies, yes. So 0304, my freshman year. No, 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 today. today. You know what the so cost today is? it's $14,490. Boom. Do you know what the out-of-state tuition is? Do I get points is? for that? No, hang on, bonus points, absolutely. You. Do you know what the out-of-state tuition is? I don't know what the out-of-state tuition is. It's $44,000. I think it's relevant. I don't think, I don't think it, that's worth it, though, Mr. If, if you're out of state. I think you just so we're gonna, I think, I think I you got, do what I, I do so and you much just time. stay at home. You I only call got so it. much time. You invest so, in a mixed tape, hey, and you just call Mr. it on Delisle. Mr. Delisle. Mr. Delisle. I want to reclaim my time. Here's the, if, 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 if you have a 20 on your ACT, you're probably not going to Harvard. Oh, right? I mean, or if your mom's Aunt Becky, you can just pay your way into USC. Well, Mr. Minaj, so what, what, what are we talking about here? Hold on a second. What are we talking about here? But, I, but, we, but, I, but I, you and I, we're both former MTV stars. You get listen, it. Let me tell you what. I was the star of MTV's well, Disaster think, Date season five. You know what it's like. We can't afford Mr. Minaj, hard. That MTV check. I'm going to reclaim my time. Okay. I know you think it's a joke. It's, it's not a joke. Yeah, but you think it is. And you want to come in here and make light of a serious situation. So I don't think it's funny. So you can sit here and, and, and do your film and make people laugh. But we're trying to have a serious conversation. And I have only five minutes. So... Okay. Leave it alone. And Mr. Minaj, since you recently um, did a story on this, and you pointed out in your opening testimony that the borrower does not control who their servicer is, does this story that I'm hearing from Liz sound familiar to anything that you heard when you were researching your show? Yes. Can you tell me what, another story briefly that you may have heard that's similar? It was, it was I can't say the names of the, the loan service provider that they were switched to, but it's very similar to that. It's very similar to the story that you mentioned where because of misinformation and they were told the wrong information, they were led down a path that was not beneficial to them in the long term. Yes, thank you. Um, and Mr. Minaj, does this seem like an administration that's putting private companies ahead of the interest of its borrowers? I just think it's terrifying that the head of the predatory loan servicing company is now in charge of this thing that's supposed to protect you. Mo moving on, I'd like to... Mr. Minaj? 
Uh, I agree with everything they've said. Uh, I think it'd be great if we could just go tools, clear history on everyone's debt. And I also think we should have a digital clock in here. I think that's a bipartisan position we can all agree on. I'm sorry. I, I don't know what time it is right now. I thought, I, for a second, I thought it was 7.10 and I started freaking out. Does it say 7.10? Well, no. it was the, 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 so if you follow the shorthand, <laughs> technically it's 1.40. All right, we'll order a Mickey Mouse clock next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Specifically allow it. If you think the law does allow persons who do not have degrees to participate in the forgiveness program, uh, please raise your hand. I'd just like to get a quick survey. If you think the law does allow it, uh, okay. All but, well, maybe don't, you don't know, sir. I, I don't know the answer. Okay, that's good enough. Okay, well, look.